this morning we are back in Mark's Gospel. So if you would please turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. This morning we're going to be looking at just two verses, 49 and 50, but these verses are rather packed with truth, <laughs> as most everything Jesus says is. And let me begin reading back in verse 38. I I uh, want to just get the context of this particular passage because I do believe it is the sort of the conclusion of everything that Jesus is saying in this text. And though we have looked at different parts of the text from different perspectives, this will give us the opportunity to see how the whole text actually works together. So let's begin back in verse 38. We read, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to hinder him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not hinder him, for there is no one who shall perform a miracle in my name and be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. And whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better for him if, with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he had been cast into the sea. And if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to stumble, cast it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire Salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Now again, I think Jesus is, is really summarizing for us what was in the text that I just read. Uh, we are going to back up even a little bit further. I just kind of was reminded as I was reading this into also, I think, something of what uh, was going on among the disciples. Uh, they were not at peace with one another because they were fighting over who would be the greatest, and that, that takes place just before the portion that I read. So again, we're going to look at this as a whole as we come to the end of this particular instruction that our Lord Jesus had to prepare his disciples for his coming departure in Jerusalem. Now again, there were certain issues that he had to deal with because of the struggles they were having, such as who would be the greatest among them? Remember that Jesus says, it's the one who has humbled himself like a believing child, who has not only the humility of faith, but also the humility of youth. I think both of which are very important. Because without them, you will not be able to stoop to become the servant of all. But the one who will, he will be the greatest. So if you promote yourself, and draw attention to yourself. You will not be the greatest, but the least in the kingdom of heaven. The servant of all does his service so that those who see it give glory to God. Which means they have to be able to set themselves aside. They have to humble themselves with that kind of humility that Jesus said was exemplified in a believing child. He taught them how, the, well, how to treat other people who aren't in their particular fellowship. That's what the text has to do with that we've just read. Jesus reminds them, if they are not against you, if they're preaching the same gospel, if they are promoting the same kingdom, then they are, in fact, for you. They are in the same church. They are on the same team. They're actually members of the same body. And of course, you and I need to be thankful that that is the case, that we aren't the only people who are the Lord's because the Lord has given to us a work that is so great, there's no way that we could possibly do it all by ourselves. 
we need help. Even the largest church on earth needs help, or at least the largest local fellowship. Now, I do believe that the body of Christ in this age is large enough to do the work which the Lord has called his church to do in this age. If it wasn't, he would certainly call more people together to do it. The problem we have is getting busy to do the work, getting it done without being distracted by the world. So the church is large enough, I believe, but the church does need to be reminded again and again and encouraged to set aside the things which are going to pass away and to set our eyes on the things which are eternal. By the way, that's what we're looking at this evening. So I hope you'll be able to come back for that. He dealt with what would happen to those who would stumble any of his children. Even among the very young who have genuine faith that it would be better for a heavy millstone to be hung around their neck and for them to be drowned in the ocean than to cause anyone who loves the Lord and whom Jesus loves to sin. So he's reminding us there that you and I need to be very careful that we don't encourage anyone to sin, but especially those who are very young and vulnerable in the Lord. By the way, one thing that we don't want to forget is that Jesus is saying here that he loves you as well if you have trusted him. And he would take it very seriously if anyone stumbled you. Finally, he dealt with how you should deal with those particular things that might make you stumble. That you need to cut those things off. Cut that member off and throw it away from you. That you need to repent of that particular thing or put off that particular practice or stay away from that particular person or that place or that activity that would cause you to stumble and to fall into sin. It's far better to let those things go than to hold on to them at the risk of hell. But basically, when the Lord says you need to cut off these offending hands and, and arms and, and eyes and so forth, what he's saying is you need to repent of all of your sins if you are to see heaven because any one sin that you hold on to is enough to condemn you forever. Now, if you are a true believer, even though you may not have conquered all of your sins, you certainly want to do so because the power of sin in your heart has been broken in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, basically, I think it's this last point that I just brought up that Jesus is really following up now and capitalizing on, although it does include everything that we've seen. In these last two verses of this teaching, now, when we looked at that past passage, the one that we just talked about as far as uh, if there's any part of you that stumbles you, cut it off and cast it away, it's better to do that than to suffer hell. We did look at it evangelistically to warn those who have not received the Lord Jesus Christ that there is a hell that exists. And it's better to give up whatever you have to give up in this world than to suffer for an eternity in unquenchable fire. And certainly, that is a legitimate use of this passage because that is exactly what Jesus is warning about. But let's not forget that Jesus intended this warning for his disciples as well, perhaps particularly. In other words, this is something that you and I have to do. When we're overtaken with any particular sin that could potentially destroy you, you need to let go of it even if those sins should be as dear to you as the parts of your body, as your hands and your feet and your eyes. I mean, why does uh, Jesus use the illustration of cutting off limbs when, as a matter of fact, the limbs are not responsible for your sins? The problem is in your hearts. It's because he knows how dear the members of our bodies are to us. I mean, no man ever hated his own body, but nourishes and cherishes it. Would you relish the thought of cutting off one of your hands or chopping off one of your feet or plucking out one of your eyes. Sometimes that's the way we feel about our sins. We don't want to let go of them because we love them too much. But the Lord says we have to let go of them. Now, I believe what the Lord tells us this morning is that the Lord is going to make sure that we do let go of these things if we are true believers. 
by sending the trials that are necessary to make us let go of them. He says, everyone will be salted with fire. Now let's consider what Jesus is talking about, not only in that particular statement, but also in the verse 50 under two heads or two, two topics. First of all, what does Jesus mean when he says that everyone's going to be salted with fire? And secondly, what you must do when you are salted with fire. By the way, there is also a textual issue here. For those of you who have the King James Version, you'll notice that verse 49 is a little bit longer than the one that I read. Uh, everyone will be salted with fire, and every sacrifice, I think, will be salted with salt, I think is the way that it goes. I don't think that it really adds anything to the text, but um, apparently some of the earlier manuscripts didn't contain that particular reading. I don't think we're leaving anything behind, but we are going to deal with that very thing in this text. So first of all, let's consider what Jesus means when he says everyone will be salted with fire. Now, not surprisingly, I think when Jesus says everyone, he likely means everyone. Now, in the context, it doesn't appear as though Jesus is really centering on a particular group as though this is only true of unbelievers or only true of believers. He seems to be speaking about both because he's been addressing both groups in this text. He's talked about those who stumble as children, about how it would be better for them to be drowned in the, in the sea. He talks about those who won't be uh, willing to cut off their hands and their feet and will go whole into the unquenchable fire who will have to actually endure hell. But he's also clearly speaking to his disciples who shouldn't stop others from serving the Lord and who should be willing to cut off their sins in order to honor the Lord and to avoid hell themselves. And certainly that's the natural meaning of the word, everyone, and it fits the context. So what does Jesus mean when he says that everyone will be salted with fire? I guess the main thing is what does it mean, what's the fire you know, that he's talking about here? Well, I think he appears to have in mind the difficult situations that everyone in the world is going to have to face. Those particular trials and temptations and difficulties that will aggravate their sins. Those trials and those temptations sent by the Lord to try the hearts of men, to show them what is in fact in them. Now, who do you think is the one that's actually doing the salting? Everyone's going to be salted with fire. Who has the ability, who has the authority to be able to do something like that except the Lord himself? I think basically Jesus is saying that the Lord is salting the earth. He is salting people with fire. Now, one thing that um, you won't hear in most churches, probably because they don't believe it, and maybe they're ignorant of it, or other reasons, you won't hear that trials, temptations, and things like this, the difficult things in life, actually come from the Lord. They don't happen by accident. It's not the devil who's masterminding them. It's actually the Lord. It's in his plan. And there's a wonderful quote, I think I put it on the back of your bulletin, by Thomas Watson. Yeah, so you can follow along as I read this. I think it was very good. It gets right to the heart of the matter. He says, It is one heart-quieting consideration in all the afflictions that befall us that God has a special hand in them. The Almighty has afflicted me. By the way, he is. this looks like it comes from a commentary or a sermon on Job. Instruments can no more stir till God gives them a commission than the axe can cut of itself without a hand. Job eyed God in his affliction. Therefore, as Augustine observes, he does not say, the Lord gave and the devil took away, but the Lord has taken away. You see... The case of Job is quite obvious. When you read Job, you understand that God was the one who gave the devil permission to do those particular things to Job. And do we think that that was the case for Job alone? Or is it also the case with us? God is absolutely sovereign over everything that happens in this world. The good things that come from him come from his hand. The difficult things that we endure in this world also come from the hand of God 
ultimately. Now, of course, the Lord means it for good in the lives of his children. And I think it's seen in, of course, the two different outcomes of this salting with fire. Actually, in, in both instances, it works for the good of God's children. Now, the unbeliever who is salted with fire and whose sins are aggravated by these difficulties, he's not going to cut off his sins. Those members of his body that offend, and so he's going to end up in the unquenchable fire. Now, that's not a good thing for them. But it is a good thing for the kingdom of heaven and the people of God that the wicked be scoured off the earth and that they are justly punished. That is the end of the salting with fire for the unbeliever. Now, we don't necessarily rejoice in that. The Lord tells us we should not rejoice in the death of the wicked or even exult over the fact that our enemy is destroyed. And so we don't want to take pleasure in the fact that that's going to happen, except, of course, from the perspective of God's justice, that God is honored in that. But I say that to say this. I need to realize, as you do, there are people here this morning that actually do fit into this category who haven't yet trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, who are unwilling to give up particular sins in their lives. If that's true of you, you actually fall into this category. And you must repent of your sins or face the eternal fire. That's what we saw last week. Now, the believer, on the other hand, is going to let go of these sins. He's going to see them, especially when they're aggravated by a trial or a difficulty, just how evil they are and how they not only offend God, but they also injure them or you know, hurt you as a believer. And so they're going to respond in the appropriate way and cut those sins off. Cut off the offending hand and foot and pluck out the offending eye. Now, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be like cutting off a part of your life, like cutting off a limb of your body. But you will do it because you know it's good. And in the end, you will be very glad that you did. Now, again, sanctification is not an easy process but it is something that yields good fruit. And we have to have our eye on that fruit and know that God means these things for good even when the trials come and our sins seem to grow stronger. God is going to give us the grace, if we are his, to vanquish that sin and come out stronger in the end. So you will be glad that you were salted with fire because it's going to help you grow in grace. Now I think that that's what Jesus has in mind when he talks about salt in the next verse. There is a salting in verse 49, but it is a salting with fire, the fire of a trial. But I believe we have in the next verse the result of that salting. Jesus says here, salt is good and have salt in yourselves. The result is of these trials a salt that is good, a growth in grace, a saltiness, basically a growth that allows you to become what is meant by the salt, and that is a savory or preserving influence in the world. Jesus says in Matthew 5.13, you are the salt of the earth. And so to summarize this point, this is what Jesus is saying, that this salting with fire or these difficulties that he brings is to produce a growth in your life in grace that will make you, if you're a Christian, a more savory influence in the world, basically a preserving or sanctifying influence in the world to preserve it from evil or to turn it away from evil and to move it towards good. So the idea of salting with fire produces something that is good. I think that's what the Lord has in mind here with regard to this salting. Now, secondly, what should you do when you are salted with fire? When the Lord sends a trial and he puts his finger on a particular area in your life, an area where you need to repent so that you can grow. Well, the answer, of course, to that question is you have to cut those sins off that he is putting his finger on. You need to let them go. 
you need to repent of them. And you need to put on the opposite virtue. Think of it in these terms. The world offers a particular kind of fun, a particular kind of pleasure. And that's the reason why we go after it, is because it's pleasurable, it's fun. But the Lord offers us a different kind of pleasure. It's, it's a good pleasure, and it's a holy pleasure. It is perhaps what we might call the pleasure of serving the Lord and knowing what it's like to know Him. What the Lord is basically telling us when He puts His finger on a particular area of our life and He salts us with fire. Again, think of a salt shaker full of fire of trials, and He's just seasoning us. And things begin to get hot. Well, when that happens, you know, certain things rise in your life and the Lord shows you something about yourself. I have been taking pleasure, or he would say you, have been taking pleasure in something that you shouldn't be taking pleasure in. And you need to put that off and begin to take pleasure in those things you should take pleasure in. I think that's what Paul means in Ephesians 4 verse 28 when he says, He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. Now, up to this time, you've, you've enjoyed taking things that belong to other people so that you can have a certain kind of pleasure for yourself. You have money or whatever it is you need and get it in a way that's easier. But what you need to do is put that off and begin to find pleasure in getting those things in the right way, working with your own hands and actually giving, more blessed to give than to receive. Instead of taking from people, give to people. Don't find your pleasure here anymore, but find your pleasure in this direction. And learn to hate the fact that you ever took pleasure in anything that was so offensive to God and that hurt other people and begin finding pleasure in honoring God and helping other people. Now, actually, this evening, that's one of the things we're going to look at, so I'm not going to develop that particular point any further. Now, what if you don't do this? What if the Lord brings a trial, and what if, um, you know, the sin rises to the surface, and what if you're struggling to let that sin go, but you're not altogether successful in it? Well, I think the, the obvious result is going to be that you're not going to have as much salt in you as you might otherwise have. Again, that savory influence, that preserving influence, that grace to be able to affect the people around you with that clear godliness that exists in your life. You're going to struggle more as a Christian if you can't let go of that sin or you want to let go of it, but it's still plaguing you. It's that besetting sin perhaps you have to deal with a lot and you're going to have less assurance. The amount of salt that you're going to have within you is going to be dependent directly on the amount of sin that you're going to be able to repent of. Again, we talk about the means of grace. Well, you have all these things in your life that are drawing the grace away from you. You've got to cut those things off, and as you do, you'll grow stronger. And of course, the Lord brings trials to make, make that stuff bubble to the surface. And the dross is there so you can see it. And he says, get rid of this particular thing. He's trying to help you get rid of it. And if you do, you grow. But if you struggle and you don't, then you struggle spiritually. But what if you fail to repent altogether? You know, what if, what if you're unwilling to let go of that particular sin? Well, I think that Jesus gives us a warning of that particular eventuality in this somewhat difficult part of the passage, which I actually haven't made allusion to yet, in verse 50. If the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? You see, sometimes trials will have the opposite effect on a person. Um, some, it'll make Christians grow. They become saltier. You know, they, they become purer. They become stronger. They grow in grace. But other people who are salted with trials they grow weaker and they become less salty, at least in a certain sense. And I think what the Lord is warning us against here is the fact that not everybody who claims to be a Christian is actually a Christian. And the one who seems to have salt that becomes unsalty, that will not be made salty again, 
it appears as though the Lord is warning us here against the unpardonable sin. And that warning occurs not just in one part of Scripture, but it actually shows up in several different places. Now, why do I believe that that's what this is referring to? Well, because of what the Lord says in Matthew 5.13, where he's making the same reference to the idea of salt losing its saltiness. He says this, if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Now, I've seen several expositions on this passage, you probably have as well, where they're saying, well, Jesus is comparing us to salt, and then he's talking about what happens when people have salt and it sits on the shelf too long and it's no longer good for anything, that they take it and they salt the path with it, and people trample it. But they seem to separate the salt from the person at that point. This is what you do with salt, but it really has nothing to do with people. Well, I think Jesus clearly here is saying that it has very much to do with a person because you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt becomes unsalty, if, if you were to become unsalty, you would no longer be good for anything, but you would be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. In other words, you would face the Lord's judgment. I think here he appears to be a warning against the same sin, and I think it's that sin of grieving the Spirit of God or resisting the Spirit of God to the point where he finally gives you over if under a trial you don't become saltier, as it were, you don't grow in grace, but instead you wither under it. It could be because there's no grace at all in your life. Again, the author to the Hebrews warns us of the same sin in Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. Why does the author of the Hebrews even say that? Well, it's because there was this group of, of Jews that were professing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who were being persecuted, and many of them were actually running away from Christ back to the Jewish ceremonial system in order to avoid the persecution. In other words, as they were salted with fire, they weren't growing in grace. They were falling away from the Lord. These were people who were actually in the church, who were counted as salt, who really had no salt in them to begin with or had maybe a common grace kind of saltiness, but they lose it all when they abandon the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a saving grace they lose, but a common work of the Holy Spirit. And I believe Jesus is warning here that there is a line that can be crossed where there is no longer a possibility of repentance. When you resist the Holy Spirit to the point where he finally leaves you, again, the author to the Hebrews does tell his audience, I, I don't think that that really has to do with you because your lives show, at least in, in the majority of them that had not forsaken and, and run away back to the Jewish system, your lives show that there is grace working in you because you are persevering. You are enduring that suffering. You have endured the, the, uh, the, the basic spoiling of all your possessions. You've suffered many things, but you're still holding fast to Christ. So he wants to encourage them to continue to do that. But again, remember that if you haven't trusted Jesus and what you're experiencing is not a genuine love for him, that there, these trials are going to bring that out. And as the Lord continues to salt, if you don't cut off those limbs, if you don't cut off those sins and really seek after the Lord, that there will eventually come a point of no return, not for the believer, but for the unbeliever, where the Spirit will abandon you for good you need to make sure that you don't cross that line. And the only way that you can be sure that you don't is by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if any of you here this morning haven't trusted Jesus because of some particular sin, because of some pleasure, some kind of fun in the world that you're not willing to give up, Jesus reminds you again that if you don't give it up, if you don't cut it off, that you may very well end up in the unquenchable fire. Whatever that sin is, consider it, whether or not it's worth it. We oftentimes deceive ourselves into justifying the, the sins that we hold on to 
and actually make them out to be something that's, that's helping us, when as a matter of fact, it's really hurting us, and in the end, it's going to destroy us. The Lord says, let go of that now and come to him. He will help you to find your pleasure in the things that are really good. So consider how you respond under a trial. When things heat up and you see your sins, do you hold on to them and indulge them and you don't want to let go of them? Or do you agree with the Lord these things are offensive and hurtful and you need to get rid of them and you call out to the Lord, Lord, help me to fight against this sin and overcome it. And the Lord gives you that grace to do it. And in the end, you come out saltier. Is that your situation or do you hold on to these things? If you hold on to them, you need to come to Christ. Now, I do believe that Jesus makes one final application that I think has to do with the disciples' response to the man who was casting out demons but who was not with them. And I think he's been making that application all the way through. When he says here, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another, I think he certainly has in mind the, the scuffle between the apostles, you know, I'm going to be the greatest. No, I'm going to be the greatest. You know, which of us is going to be the greatest? And then Jesus asked them, what were you talking about? I don't want to tell you, you know, because it was sinful and we should have been talking about it in the first place. Well, Jesus certainly by this statement intends that his disciples would stop bickering over who's going to be the greatest and that they would be at peace with one another and serve one another. Again, that's how the instruction began. And this is what each of us needs to do if we're at odds with anyone in the body of Christ, if there is an outstanding offense that you need to deal with it even before you come and worship the Lord, because whether you're the offender or the offended, you're still responsible to deal with that outstanding offense and make sure that as, as much as it relies on you or depends on you, that you try to be reconciled to that individual who may be either offended or the offender. But he does appear to mean just a little bit more than this. I think that he's also addressing how to treat people who are in, or believers, who are in other fellowships. The man was trying to cast out demons, or actually was casting them out, and the disciples tried to stop him. And Jesus said they shouldn't hinder him. Remember what we saw at the beginning of this text. Jesus seems to be addressing him and those like him as well. There were those who were for them, even though they might not be with them, who might actually not only be doing the work of the kingdom of heaven, but might actually help them by giving them a cup of cold water that would be rewarded by Jesus in the end for so doing. These are the ones that Jesus said they should avoid stumbling through this kind of exclusive, you know, this exclusivistic kind of a harsh spirit that if you're not with us, you're, you're not in the kingdom of heaven. These are the ones Jesus said they should protect and they should avoid stumbling by cutting off their own sins. You know, don't stumble any of these little ones who believe in me. It'd be better if you were, if somebody wrapped a millstone around your neck and you were cast in the ocean. So if you're tempted to do that, well, cut off the offending part. I think Jesus has this in mind all the way through. Jesus says, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. And I think what he means by one another is not just those who were there, present in that small circle of disciples, but he was also referring to the body of Christ in general, which was already larger than the small circle of that, of, of that group that was following Jesus. They needed to make sure that they didn't stumble those who were outside the inner circle, but to be at peace with them as well. And again, I think that's a good reminder to us because we did deal with this several weeks ago. Uh, your Lord's children, basically other members of the body of Christ, members of the body that you're a part of, members of your body, are really spread throughout many different denominations. And just because they're not in this particular one, and just because they don't believe exactly the way that you do doesn't mean that Jesus isn't going to own them as his own on that day. And if they are his, 
by faith in his name, then you need to own him. You need to own them as your brother and as your sister. So let's not be exclusivistic. But let's remember the body of Christ is broader than we are. Now, there are, of course, boundaries to it. <laughs> as a, um, uh, Actually, an audio, which I found the audio for that video that you recommended to me, it reminds us that there are boundaries to who are actually members of the body of Christ. They do have to believe the fundamentals, but there are a lot of churches that do believe the fundamentals. Sometimes we tend to write them off because they're not with us. Jesus says, whoever is not against us is for us, and we need to receive them as members of the body of Christ, and we need to try to help them do their work as well and encourage them and be encouraged that they're actually out there working with us to accomplish the one goal which is to extend the body of Christ. Hopefully we're not in it just to build large churches. That doesn't seem to be the case in, in this particular ministry. But it would be wrong in any case to set out just to build a large church. That's not what we're after. What we're after is trying to bring people into the kingdom of heaven, regardless of what church they actually end up attending. Certainly we want to be able to teach them the truth and to have the opportunity to do that, but sometimes... The Lord is leading them somewhere else because there's something there he wants them to learn. And we need to let the Lord do that, but not exclude them because they're not in our particular body. So Jesus says to you this morning, in summary, let the trials that he brings into your lives burn up the dross of your sin, basically encourage you to cut off those sins that afflict you, let them burn up the dross and cause you to grow in grace so that you will not only yourself be saved from judgment. I mean, this process does need to be ongoing if you're a Christian. It's one of the badges of membership in the body of Christ is that you endure through the trial and that you're growing in grace. So not only that you would be saved from judgment, but that you would have a savory or a salty influence in the world in turning others from sin to Christ and maybe causing other people to repent of their sins and turn into the right direction, but also that you may be peacemakers within the church, not just the local church or the local body, but also the larger body of Christ. Well, may the Lord help us uh, to do these things. Uh, they're not easy to do, and it's not easy to go through these things, but God is faithful to bring these things into our lives so that uh, we will grow. I think it's just another way of saying what the author to the Hebrews says, the father disciplines every child whom he receives. That discipline is the salt shaker full of fire the Lord puts on us, and that helps us to grow in grace. So don't wince under it. Certainly don't abandon the Lord under it, but grow in grace. Let, it, let those trials and difficulties push you to Christ so that you may grow in your usefulness to him. Let's uh, bow in a moment of silent prayer and, and let's ask the Lord to um, apply his word to our, our lives this morning.